high expectations. Right. Heather, no we're, pressure. We're, we're, we've got the rush to the coffee break, so we're going to uh, we'll have to canter <laughs> through it, I think. But um, you've talked this morning um, in quite a big piece in the Telegraph, um, very much in in the same sort of vein as as Larry Fink, and as the expectation of capital now in terms of what it is in terms of where your money needs to go. And you've talked about name and shaming and name and faming. Pick up the story for us. So it actually ties up very closely with the previous um, session. Um, so here we're talking about climate change and clearly money talks. Um, ultimately, investors do have huge power to change things. A couple of years ago, um, Ligon General that I work for now um, was asked by HSBC Pension Fund to come up with a fund that was designed to achieve higher sustainable returns. So that's a very important starting point with a climate change tilt. And in the course of that, um, Elgin decided to, Ligon Jim decided to come up with a climate change pledge, whereby we um, undertook that we would work with what was identified as the around 90 large companies across the globe who we thought would have most um, impact, I mean, six sectors, not all energy companies, um, on the transition to a low carbon world. Now, time has moved on. Um, those companies who we've tried to engage with in quite a detailed way since then, who haven't done anything about it, who've ignored us, um, we're going to announce a list at the end of May uh, where we'll divest um, for the funds that can from those companies. Obviously, we're also going to recognise the companies that are doing a great right. deal. Okay. So name and fame as well as name, name and shame. So that's, that's a, pretty big, um, a pr pretty big message. Well, I mean, we run out of... Pay, you run out of patience. I mean, what it, I think undermines credibility of investors if we don't can, follow through. Can you give a message back? Because there will be mm. there are people that believe that the business of business is business. That actually some of the things that you're talking about are for policymakers. It's for other sorts of parts of the of society and the economy to address. What is the message to these people now, in terms of these changes that we're seeing from investors? So this is because profit and purpose. You started the, the day by saying you know profit and purpose are aligned. And um, if you look at the uh, climate change issue, then there are very clear, and it was obviously discussed at length in the previous panel, um, no barbed comment about the at length bit there meant, but you know, about um, how there are financial risks. Uh, Mark Carney uh, talked very clearly about the financial risks in his um, very well-known speech. Uh, coal companies have lost 75% of their value in the past six years. And there's also huge financial opportunities. So last year, obviously, was the big year of the electric car. 60 models globally right. announced. There are big opportunities. So it's, it's completely tied together. It's not that you choose, oh, I'm going to do the right thing. And that's the thing I think is really interesting, is that so, a, lo a lot of people will say, well, these are obligations, they're unreasonable yeah. sign of finance. But actually, the opportunities of things like electric cars or things like AI, climate change, is that where we're going to see the future business winners of tomorrow? Well, yeah, well, obviously, I mean, we won't invest in a, an auto manufacturer that's just, you know, ignoring that trend at all. There are going to be huge successes, huge winners. Um, and pension fund trustees um, are required by law to take into account of, of environmental, social and governance issues where it will have a material financial impact. So those, those issues are colliding. Um, and hopefully, I mean, there was a question towards the end about retail investors. We have a big investment gap in this country. A lot of people don't invest and don't have a secure financial financial future, this might attract them. And just on pension funds, mm. I mean, is this, is this charge being led by businesses or do you think that there are actual investors, citizens, people that want to see good ends for their capital? Their well, definitely. Capital? I mean, um, this is perhaps going to tie on to eventually the theme that I've been yes, asked to talk going, about. But um, so that, I mean, women uh, in this country are half as much invested um, as men. Uh, young people, and obviously often they don't have a lot of money to invest, but want to build some form of nest egg. I think it needs to be compelling. It's not just people who need to be told it's good for right. you, but actually if they know that's being put to good use for the future. Okay, so let's, get, let's get to the title. A good time <laughs> to be a girl. Why? Tell us. So, I mean, I sort of want to throw that back and ha say, well, well, how could it not be at the moment? I mean, my optimism is based partly on um, experience of my own 30-year career in the city, and it's obviously not all sorted yet, but there has been a radical change in terms of the inclusiveness and the way this subject is dealt with broader, of course, in the city. But really, I feel at the moment that a whole host of issues, and this has been touched on very beautifully already by a number of the speakers, are coming together to create a real um, change in how we work, how we live, how we bring up families, how we position for the future. Um, technology is an obvious one whereby, I mean, uh, uh, in my own team, we're just introduced agile working. It's not done to be nice to women um, or to make it easier for people necessarily. It's, it's designed to make uh, people happier, have more engagement, more productive. And this gives us a chance to rethink. I mean, I think we'll look back and we'll think we got all used to this really odd setup where we yeah. set up where we would have long 
commutes and sit on the same desk and work in a certain way. Obviously, there are lots of cultural aspects. I'm not glossing over that. But that gives a huge opportunity to change right, okay. how we work. Now, when, when we last spoke, women. you made the point that because things were changing so quickly and you were writing a book, you were almost having to rewrite it by the week. Give us a sense of <laughs> the journey, because we've seen so much change in the last 12 months. Give us a sense of where we've come yeah. from and perhaps where we're going to. So it's an important point, because obviously the, the flip side of the coin, people might think, is that we've had a real crescendo of noise around gender equality in particular in the last year, and it's, a lot of it's been very negative. So obviously we've had a lot of exposure around sexual harassment scandals. We've had a lot of you know, the President's Club dinner here. We've had uh, ge glaring gender pay gaps. So some people might think, well, it's all terrible. You know, this is kind of the worst moment. But actually, I would challenge that all of those practices and those behaviors and those reasons why women, we have the gender pay gap, have been going on uh, uh, products of multiple years. And what's different is that now we have transparency and we, we know about them. And men, uh, as well as women, are saying, well, this isn't the way we want to operate in the future world. And actually, I think you're seeing this is a death throes of an old regime. Again, real fast to change. But I did have to keep, in fact, I just sent the first draft in and you know the BBC you know the today program you know presenters being paid you know the women well, being paid I've a right. fraction of the men sort of happened the next day and so it went on so uh, is, is equality the only dividend we can I mean, will we see better businesses by these changes do you think and if so, so I mean I think equality is a vast dividend I mean it's not just the yeah. gentleman before uh, but we understand that we understand yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what we're playing for but in terms well, of the sorts of how will the business scene change as a result yeah so I would challenge do we understand that because I think a lot of it is seen as actually being fair and having opportunity that's equal, which is obviously hugely important. I think the bigger thing actually is we've lived for centuries um, in most parts of the world, if not all parts of the world, where implicitly, if not explicitly, one half of society has sort of been superior to the other. Mm. Now, if we take away that superiority, if we are all mucking in together, if we're all partners, whether it's, you know, I'm not talking about a few women in the boardroom and a few men at the school gates, but actually rethinking how we, how we live, then actually that's the opportunity for less aggression, less um, sense of the other, uh, less, you know, more genuine inclusion, including racial and, and sexual equality. And, and I mean, I think that is huge. And, better and world. it's not, it is a better world. It's not just a sort of little prize for now we have better diversity. So when, when you think about initiatives that you have founded and, and mm. sort of led, like the 30% club, do, if you were setting that, so 30% of women leaders on boards, if you were setting that up today, would you have a different percentage in mind? It's a tricky one because I actually I think there was a time and a place to set up the 30% club um, and this was obviously related to the financial, well not obviously, but it was related to the financial crisis and we had 12% women on board so 30% seemed a big enough target but also it was very focused on women whereas I think what's happened is you know, I've set up the, the diversity project, um, perhaps campaigners are serial campaigners within the investment community to try to shake up all or broaden all diversity dimensions. Um, socioeconomic has been touched on, uh, disability, you know, there are a lot of um, talent that we are not um, attracting. So I actually think it's less about the percentage and more about would I just focus mm. on women. You're going to update the forward to the book, I understand, in terms of the next, uh, when, when it's the next mm. edition comes out. What, what are you going to say? So what I wanted to do is obviously, um, uh, well, a few things that I feel, and it's good when you put out a book, and I'm hopefully not discouraging anyone from reading it, um, but there's, there are clearly things that have happened that I've wanted to make sure that is current. But, but more essentially, I think the point of um, some of my arguments about how do people can feel more included at a local level, at a community level, and I think, again, we've got this tussle between big business and sometimes small business and society, um, and I think that's part of the answer to think more I mean we talk to uh, sometimes we talk about regulation and all of these things are done to people from afar and I think including people is important I will also update I think we need I need to have included more on what parents can do it's a I'm a multiple parent I can, whatever that's not didn't come out right, did I? I have lots of children. <laughs> Multiple parents. You have That's a lot new of invention. kids. I, I have a lot of children. Uh, um, and, um, you know, I think a lot of people say, oh, I'd have liked to have a bit more on, you know, how to, with social media, you know, the dark side of digital technology. Um, but most importantly, I want to make it a bit more explicit about how we can redevise the world of mm. work. And the final question to take us into the break, when we think about, I mean, I, I'm a dad to two girls, and I think about their future. Mm. When you start to sort of frame that in terms of the things that we're doing now, how will we look back and what can they look forward to? 
Well, I do think we have to um, make young girls feel very, or very much aware that there, there is a huge potential for them. I think the danger with all of the media focus in the past few months particularly has been that young women might think, you know, all men are predators or, you know, not to join a male-dominated profession or industry because they won't be able to get along. And that would be a huge shame and take us off course. So I think making sure that they feel empowered to write their own future this is the moment when well, young people... What's advice you? I mean, how do we get oh, people that are going to go down the road that you're going to go? Because they have to be the change makers themselves, don't they? Yeah. They have to shake out these, these areas of the economy. So I, I have met a lot of young people, not, not just through my own children, but speaking at schools, universities, um, speaking at university tomorrow, actually. And um, I'm, I'm constantly struck, and you showed it beautifully in the video, the, the one uh, Young World um, video, that the, there is huge optimism um, and energy young people have. A lot of people feel daunted by the future. I have myself tried to live my life. I've realized um, by, I didn't read them early on in life, but um, came across something that I did quote in the, in the book, which is about your individual capability. And I, it's, it's a little quote, it's, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I, I will not let what I cannot do interfere with what I can do. And if we can each say, you, we can do something um, and create that world. I, I, I feel very um, optimistic about the young people and, and um, see, they believe that. They just want to be told they can do it. Helen Morrissey, thank you so much. Thank you. Very good, excellent. Good. Thank you.